Hello, my name is Alan Ark. I am currently a senior QA engineer with Duo Security. Just kind of wondering, how many people here actually use Duo at work? One person, two people, a couple of people. I know lots of people upstairs do. Uh, Duo Security, we uh, ensure trusted access for employers and employees trying to get to work. Uh, we are hiring duo.com. Uh, check out the job link right now. When I was hired in July, I was the fourth QA engineer looking to add two more by the end of the year and looking to double for next year. Uh, currently, I work remote uh, from Portland. Home office is in Michigan, of all places. But if you think you are a rock star and want to help contribute to making things safer for the world, at least for employers, uh, come talk to me. I'm also leading uh, one of the dining, uh, dining around Portland tonight, uh, 6.30. We'll meet at the mezzanine, and uh, I am leading a group that's going to the art house. A little more about me. I already talked about the Yard House. They have great beer. Beer is one of my passions. I volunteer every year at the Holiday Ale Fest, so that's a little bit more about me. Um, I'm a speaker. I've spoken at QNSQC a bunch of times. Also have presented in Vegas for Better Software, and also at Quality Week uh, in San Jose back in 1999. And on the side, I work for things like Grimm because it's fun. <laughs> But two things that I really am passionate about are quality and golf. And I always tell people when you're choosing a career, choosing a job, you have to do what you love. And you also have to love what you do. And if you can find something where that's really true, then you are probably in the right job. If you are in a position where that's not true, find a different job. If that job doesn't work out, maybe find a different career. Because if you are not doing what you enjoy, it will show. So enjoy your work. But here, uh, again, I'm just going to be talking about how I've taken lessons from, from golf. And I'm not a awesome golfer. I do break 100 regularly, but I'm not going pro anytime soon. Hence, I'm in software. Talk about golf. Golf is a wonderful game for me. It's really just chasing a ball with a stick through a park except I'm normally in the trees, or in the water, or in the sand. So it's a beach, forest, lots of places. Uh, but the idea with golf is you want to shoot as low a score as you can. And the way golf's kind of wonderful in the fact that you can have different players with different skills compete against each other because their score is adjusted by a handicap. One course here, this is my home course, there are three different sets of tees, and each tee will it will give you a different distance from the hole to the tee box for every single hole. And the idea is that if you are a better golfer, they're going to try to make it a little more difficult. So we call that the blue tees. And the blue tees play at 6,700 yards. And that's pretty far. I play from the white tees because I'm not super awesome. That plays at 6,400 yards. My wife plays from the red tees that's at 5,500 yards. But the idea is no matter what our skill levels, we can play the same course and try to look at the scores and figure out, all right, are we competitive or not? The idea is, well, I, I'm a little bit better than she is, but with the handicapping system, it makes things just a little bit easier and make it more competitive and a lot more fun. Because the bottom line is you want to have fun playing anything that you do. So when you're trying to achieve par, par is just a score. It would be a number where a typical golfer might want to sink the ball into the hole from the tee box. You have par threes, which is uh, like a section where you have expected to have three shots to get to the hole, one shot from the tee, and you're expected two putts to get in the hole, and that would be a par three. Par four, a little bit longer, might take you two shots to get to the green. A par five might take you three shots to get to the green. But the assumption is it's always going to be two shots from the green or get you out. But there's lots of things that can go wrong. Uh, in Penny's talk today, she was talking about the goal is immutable, but your path is uh, very, very agile. And that's kind of what golf is. You know where the hole is. You know where you are. And you just want to get there in as few strokes as possible. A lot of things can go wrong. Though. Lots of golf courses have what we call hazards, ponds, lakes, sand traps. And the idea is you want to try to avoid that. Just like at work, you come up with different requirements. Why are those requirements there? They're trying to help set the bounds to figure out what you want to deliver to your customers. And you can come up with ideas of how you want to try to avoid. 
But we're human. We always make mistakes. Sometimes we do land at a hazard, no matter what we do. And there'll be times, like, I see the water there. I'm going to aim over here. And I swing, and it goes right in the water. That happens. But the idea is that you can try to mitigate that, not only with the game of golf, but also with, with software delivery. Sometimes you shoot yourself in the foot. That's okay, it happens. But if you hit yourself with a golf ball, that's a two-stroke penalty. You swing, you miss. Well, you know, you learn something. Maybe you just miss the ball. You adjust from that to make your next strokes a little stronger. Uh, and today, something, uh, this past week actually, something happened. Uh, I had a, my regular foursome playing, and uh, we all play with each other for years. We know how we all play. One guy was just up ahead, maybe 75 yards, a little bit to the left, and I shanked the ball. I don't usually shank the ball that bad. I hit his cart. I had to take a penalty stroke for that. I was like, that's, that's kind of weird. It happened. You just have to uh, just go with flow. With software, again, you want to try to minimize risk. You want to figure out how you can avoid the hazards. All we do as quality engineers is we should be asking questions. Uh, I heard this uh, in many different talks. Ask why. I mean, that again, Penny, pull that one out for her. I think I'm going to steal all her slides and just regurgitate them because a lot of those things resonate with me. And the idea is if you can figure out why that particular requirement is there, maybe you can have some influence to help refine it. It's always easier to figure out what really is the goal and then figure out what the solution is to that as opposed to getting a very vague requirement that could have too many ways to interpret it and then implementation can go haywire. By trying to really understand what truly is to be delivered to the customer, get that defined sooner, you can avoid a lot of problems later on. So question assumptions. I always question the assumptions that you make because when I don't, it comes back to bite me. Because, oh, I thought we meant, we agreed to implement it this way. And then you find out, oh no, there's actually a design problem that we agreed not to do it that way. So no matter where you're at, always take the time, take a step back, deep breath, ask why, and communicate with your team members to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that anybody has a chance to question any of the assumptions you made or give you more input. I know when I'm playing golf, and if, especially if it's a partner game or a team game, I'm always saying, help, what should I do? <laughs> because I know what I want to do, and maybe the one time out of ten, it's going to be perfect. It'll be right on the game. But what happens about those other nine times? The idea is I talk to my partner and say, hey, should I take that out of play? Should I club up? What do you think? How am I doing today? Golf is kind of finicky. No matter how well you play or how well you don't play, every single day is different. There are some days where I can drive, can't putt. Some days I can putt, can't drive. Sometimes I can't do anything right. Sometimes it all comes together. You just don't know. So I'm always trying to get feedback. How am I looking for that? What should I do? Because I know what I think I should do, but really, should I do that? Same thing with software. The reason why we work in teams is so that we all can help each other. Recognize when potential hazards are present. I'm going to emphasize this again. If you know there is a potential hazard out there, you will do everything you can to kind of avoid the hazard. This guy, walking down the fairway, there's a crocodile right there by the water. His caddy is like, mm -hmm, whatever. And they're laughing about it now because nobody got hurt. The idea is they recognize that there's a head there staring in the face, sharp teeth. It could cause physical damage. With golf, that's one of the things you need to do. Recognize where those hazards are. You can look at where you're standing. Oops, sorry. Look at where you're standing and then figure out where you want to go. You can take hazards out of play. You can avoid the sand traps, avoid the water. If it's kind of windy, maybe you take an extra club and make it go a little further and counteract the effect of wind. It's going to have on your ball, aim for a different target. The idea is you have information, use that in a feedback loop to figure out what your decision for your next target is going to be. And that's really the same thing with software. Why are we all using, well not all using, a lot of us move to more of a scrum, agile. The idea is that you have iterations where instead of having one mammoth release a year, you break that up into little pieces. Why? 
each one of those little pieces is an intermediate target. So you get rapid feedback. Am I delivering the right thing? Well, we'll tell you in two weeks. You can do that. When you're playing golf, you're choosing different clubs, different conditions, same thing with software. Pick the right people, pick the right tools for the job, pick the right processes that work for you. There is no magic book that says this is the way you do Scrum, this is the way you do Agile, this is the way you must test. If there is a book and your company is saying you must follow the book, you can say, why? There's some things there that might work for you, some things that don't. Feel free to take what works for you and chuck what doesn't. The whole idea, with one of my favorite things about Agile, is that it wants you to try. If you fail, that's okay. You learn something. Try something different. The idea is don't stay stagnant. Always learn from your experience. Take the hazards out of play, asking why. Are these the right requirements? Is this what the customer wants? Is this what they need? Is this what they ask for? People don't know the answer? That's okay. Find someone who does. If someone says, I don't know, don't just walk away. Drive, help your teammates drive to, that, to answer that question. Because if the answer is, I don't know, and nobody follows up with it, guess what's going to happen when it actually goes out? It's going to come back. You get a boomerang project. So ask those questions early and often. And always pick out intermediate targets that you can achieve. And one thing I love about working in sprints is the fact that, all right, this we'll get this amount of work done, and here are the goals and features we're going to deliver in a couple weeks. It gives you a chance to say, oh, that worked really well. We can do more. This is what we're going to do the next sprint. Or you can say, Oh, that was a little bit weird. That's a little bit too much. Let's rethink about what we're doing. We didn't finish what we committed to in the sprint. Why? Bad requirements? Well, we refine them a little more. Some people have um, backlog grooming sessions every other week. I work at jobs, and this, I still do this in my job. I brought this in. I do backlog grooming every week because the idea is that if we are taking a look at our backlog a lot, we'll have a better idea of what we can work on in the future. And by really narrowing down, putting the acceptance criteria in, getting together as a team, we escalate issues early. We say, well, you know, as a tester, this is one thing I'm going to look at. Mr. Developer, did you think about that? No. Well, now we can. We can talk about it. And we can help product really define what the criteria should be moving forward. And the idea is talk, 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 ask questions. Now, this is actually my golf bag. Um, the idea is when you, when you play golf, you're going to be going for certain distances. Now, friends of mine, they play disc golf, I play ball golf, um, but you're always going to be aiming for a target, and the target's going to be some distance away. I can take one club and just use the same club over and over and over, but it may not actually do the job. So the idea is, in my toolbox, my golf bag, I have lots of different clubs. So each club will go a certain distance and has a certain purpose. But that club is going to behave a little bit differently for someone else. I love talking about 150 yards out on a golf course. People say, why should I hit? Well, I always ask them, what is the club that you use to hit 150 yards out? Why 150? Well, most courses, they actually have a little mark. Every hole, 150 yards. So you can know, how far am I away from 150? Oh, 20 yards away. That's probably meaning I'm 170 yards away. Again, intermediate target. Why? Because it's easier for you to estimate how far you're away from here to that easel than from here to the sidewalk. That's pretty far. That's pretty far. This intermediate going this way. A lot easier to do estimation. So for 150 yards from my wife, she hits the driver. That's her tool of choice, and she hits it right about 150. So anytime I'm asking her where we are. And it's on a tee box, and the par three is 150 yards. I'm like, sweetheart, driver. And she's like, yep. And she hits it on the green. She hits it dead straight, which is kind of hilarious. I've been trying to hit it straight for years, and she's like, oh, there it is. Ooh, I love this game. For me, 150 yards is six iron. But for someone who's a professional, like Sergio Garcia, who just I recently won his first uh, major, the uh, Masters Championship, his 150 yard club is a nine iron. So it's pretty much. The driver is the one that's going to go the furthest, and the 9-iron is pretty much one of the shorter clubs. It's not going to go very far. But for a professional, it went 150 yards. That's quite a lot. But the idea is that it could be like the same tool you have. 
people are going to use it differently. You may behave a little bit differently. But you have to know what to choose. So what are the conditions you have to think about? Uphill, ball's not going to fly as far because it goes up, and then just goes there. On a flat lie, the ball goes up, then it comes back down, and you see you get a little more distance. What about the wind? Wind is a killer. If the wind's in your face, you hit the ball, you think it's going to go further? No. It might even come back at you. But one time I was in Vegas, and I hit a putt, and I, I missed the putt badly. It was going up the hill. But the wind was so strong, the ball came back down the hill and into the cup. It literally went into the, into the hole. And my uh, brother-in-law was kind of looking at me, like, really? I'm like, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes luck, better than skill. But you always take a look at the conditions you're in. Now, so practice doesn't always make perfect. This guy's been practicing long and hard, and he's got this move. And, uh, please, don't practice that. What do you want to do? You want to be sure to practice the right things. What are those right things? Well, you're here at PNSQC, you've heard lots of talks already, and you've heard some things that are worth other people. Have you tried those things? If not, try them. See what happens. You won't know how some of those ideas you're, you're hearing about are going to work for you until you try it. Try it. Practice the right things. What does that really mean? Work with products. Communicate with them to figure out what really should be the thing that gets delivered. And if you can work with product, you can help get actionable stories. You can get stories where the acceptance criteria, as a quality engineer, you can be happy about. You can tell developers ahead of time, this is what I'm testing. Each one of those tests now becomes a task on that story. And when they actually execute on it, it's probably going to pass. Developers are really good about making things pass when they already know ahead of time what you're looking at. I always give them the answer sheet. There's no reason for me to hide that. Because if they can get it right the first time, my job's easy, and I can go practice putting. Define the expectations up front. Very true. Like I said, you give them the answer sheet. They know what's coming. I know what I'm going to be asking for. Things can change. That's fine. Be agile about it. Communicate with your team. And refine the backlog, backlog often. Because if you spend the time really refining that backlog, planning becomes so much easier. Instead of having an all-day planning session, we're just talking about stories you recently discussed. Everybody is familiar with the stories. You know what's going to be coming down the pike. You don't need to spend a lot of time in one big meeting to do refinement and for planning. What you're actually doing is you are breaking up that time into different slots. So you're spent, actually spending the same amount of time. It's just broken up differently. So... I don't know about you guys, but for me, after like an hour and a half in a meeting, I start the daydreaming. It doesn't work so well. So day-long planning sessions for me, I don't do so well. And I said, hey, no, but how about we just break this up? Backlog planning every week for hour, hour and a half. Planning, hour, hour and a half. Let's try it. And it's worked out really well at some company. Not every company likes that. It depends on the people. It depends on the culture. But it was something I said, let's try it and actually stole it from somebody I used to work with because I'm like, that's a great idea. It's like obvious. Oh, not so obvious to me, but I'm going to try it because I liked it. But the idea is, yeah, you never know. Give it a shot. Get to know the customer perspective. If you can get to know the customer perspective, you have a better shot of actually delivering something they're asking for, even if they don't know what they're asking for. So at Duo, we make it a thing where everybody has actually all the information about the company. My first day, I had access to all the financials. That was kind of scary. I was like, really? <laughs> I can go see like how much people signed the contract for? Yeah. You want to see what the sales call is like. They have records. I've been invited on uh, be a fly on the wall on some of the sales calls because they really want you to understand what are the concerns our customers have. What are they looking for? What are the pain points? I've been a quality engineer for over 20 years, and some of the jobs have more security concerns than others. And it's always been this dichotomy. You want it secure, or you want me to get work done. You can't have both. It's one or the other. At Duo, they kind of have, we do kind of have both. 
we try to make the customer experience as painless as possible. And we don't actually set the rules. We let that, we let the uh, organization's IT group come up with the rules that they want. But the, the crux of it is that we allow people to log in from anywhere. We don't have a VPN they need to come in. But they do two-factor all the time. And we let the organization figure out which devices they want to allow two-factor at, uh, which applications, and, and who they want to give access to. That's what our customer perspective is. And we really feel we have a, a good pulse on that. So we can understand and anticipate what they would want for new features. And because we have a great appreciation for the customer, we, we know why our work is important. So many times in other places, I ask people, hey, what are you working on? Oh, I got this automated test to do this. Go, Why is that important? I, I don't know. It's like a manual test. Someone had and I'm just doing it. But why? Nobody uses that feature. That feature is legacy. That feature is going to be deprecated. Why spend effort? I don't know. People told me to do that. Feel free to ask them, what is the business value of whatever you're working on? Why is this important? Why do I need to spend energy on this as opposed to something that might have a bigger bang for the buck. And when you actually are successful, celebrate those wins. If you don't celebrate the wins, it can have some consequences down the road, especially for more now. If you know you did a great job, celebrate it. You finished the sprint, everything got done, celebrate it. I mean, every day, celebrate something because it really just keeps your energy up will make work go smoother, and your team will be a lot happier. It's really true. I've been to places they don't celebrate often enough, and you can tell. You just walk in the office, and everybody's like, yeah, what kind, of, what kind of job is that? You want to have fun. Other things to do. Like I said before, like I'm, before I take a shot, I'm, if I'm playing a team game, I'm like, all right, what should I do? Ask for help when you need it. There should be no shame in asking for help. Asking for help is never a sign of weakness. Asking for help means you want somebody else's input. Nothing wrong with that. That's a great thing to practice. People come up to me all the time with questions. Oh, I feel like this is a stupid question. Like, no, no question is stupid. The only stupid question there is is the one you don't ask. Because you might get more information that you didn't have before. And that may change the entire outcome of what you're working on. Be sure to collaborate with the other engineers. This is a pattern. You heard it from me, you heard it from other people. This is real. Software does not write itself, even if you have machine learning. It takes people to tell the computers what to do. Get, and as a quality engineer, I always try to get involved with code reviews. Because if nothing else, it gives me a better idea of what the developer is thinking. It gives me a better idea of what they have in their head as for the vision for the particular feature you're working on which you may have a different opinion. I mean, we get paid to have a different opinion. We get paid to ask those questions. It's part of the job. Offer help to those in need. Again, no stupid questions that you ask. No one else is going to ask stupid questions. Always put yourself out there. Make those connections with people. Give them the help that they need. And appreciate your coworkers. I don't know how many places I don't feel like this is the case where nobody on the team really comes to work and say, how can I screw up the day? Right? No, nobody says that. Sometimes that's what happens, you know, but it's like an accident. Like everything, the plans align badly. And then something happens. But nobody comes to work saying, you know, really? And if you appreciate your kill workers and you can celebrate those wins, you start to build the trust. And then if you know you can trust your team, they said they're going to do something. You can count on them. You don't have to worry as much. That's a big thing. Surprise takeaway. And I've been kind of teasing this to people. The takeaway for this talk, it's here. Golf, software, it really doesn't matter. Any vertical, any job. It's about the people. The biggest thing that I learned when playing golf, and I play golf a lot, a couple times a week, lots of courses, the people that I meet, we all have a love for the game. But everybody plays the game a little bit differently. And if it's a team game, I want to be sure that I can count on them. 
maybe not to execute every shot and shoot like birdies and eagles all over the place. But I want to know that you know, when push comes to shove and like they're really struggling and they're grinding away, things are not going away, their energy is not going to be negative. Because we understand it's just a stupid game. No matter how much I love it. And I trust them to let me know, hey, you're not having a great day. Just relax. Here's a birdie bottle. Have a good time. A little bit of swing oil. The idea is just kind of shake it off. If they're having a bad day, bring them up. Do that in software too. How many times are you working with someone you know they're great to work with, but they're just having a bad day? Everybody has a bad day. But if you can help them, just kind of shake it off. Pick them up. Pick up your teammates. It is so powerful. Truly work together as a team. Because everybody's in the same boat. And when you really work together as a team, and you practice the right things, sometimes you get something you can celebrate. But it really is all about the team. Without the team, there is nothing. Practice the right things, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> and that's my talk. So, if there are any questions, feel free to ask me. Yes? Yes? Yeah, so the question was, uh, so over my experience of 20 years, do I stick with one particular role or see where the organization needs help? I'm of the one where I just want to move the ball forward and I will do whatever it takes that the company needs to achieve something better. I'm always a big proponent of move the ball forward. Be better than today. And I've been at places where I've been the first QA and there was really no testing whatsoever. No smoke test to find, nothing to find. I had a company where the president, the CEO of the company, was on the phone with customers after a release because nothing was working. I love that job because that bar was so low, I came in here and did this, this, this. They're like, oh, you're awesome. I'm like, I know. <laughs> but I guess the common theme is I do tend to move to whatever needs to get done. I was at a job where it's, we had a DevOps team, but uh, they didn't have resources available to help my particular team get things like our CI loop in place. So I learned Team City. I literally learned it on the job to build a CI pipeline. Uh, we had deployments that had to get done. I learned Octopus deploy because that my team needed it and nobody else had any free cycles. And I'm like, huh, this might be fun. Fun in a very painful way because I didn't know. But the idea too was I had people at the company who I could freely ask questions with because they trust me that I was going to do my best and I'm not dumb, but I'm not an expert. So every time I had my questions, I write them down, show them what I tried to do, try to prototype anything that I could and say, hey, this is what I got. And they said, oh, that's, that's close. Let's try this. I'm like, it works. I'm like, oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciated my coworker. You know what? That made him feel pretty good. But guess what happened the next time I asked for help? He's like, yeah, no problem. What do you need? And when if he had questions, he came to me. Same thing. I'm like, what, what do you need? Let's talk. Let's go get a beer. Let's get lunch. Let's grab a conference room. Let's chat. Um, the idea is help them because they're going to help you. You build trust that way, and it just it's a magic snowball. It gets bigger, and it's a like, full love. You're not going to get crushed in the weight. In fact, everybody's going to help push it up. 
And so that's my ex expertise with that. Is I just try to figure out what needs to get done. I know my skills. I know what I can handle. People have questions. I'm like, okay, be honest about it. It's like, I don't know this, but I will try. And then if I need help, who can I ask? You know, get that expectations. Who can I ask for help when I run into problems? So you're not off your own on an island somewhere. And people know what you're working on. And they know that you are going to try because everybody tries. So hopefully that answers the question. Yes? All the time. <laughs> but I always tell them, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't go, in, yeah, yeah, sure. I perform assess all the time with that particular tool. No, nah, I perform assess with other tools, but not that one. And we're going to see what happens. In fact, part of uh, the learning experience for me is the fun part. Like, I'm trying different things. This didn't work. That I learned something. Yeah, don't do that. Try something else, you know. And with experience, you start to recognize patterns. And then, so I pull from the patterns uh, with new tools, new implementations, uh, just to try to create something for that organization. Uh, I do a lot of test automation, but the biggest thing that I really live by is whatever I'm writing is going to be maintained by someone else if I win the lottery. So I try to create a lot of documentation around that and try to write my code in a way that it's not very esoteric and go to here and here. But it should just make sense. Someone should be able to pick up my code and know exactly what it's doing. But that being said, you walk into a situation where you try, you fail. Like I said, that should be fine. If you're in a culture where they allow you to fail because you're learning something, you're making progress, that's a good thing. But if they see failure and they make judgment, you're bad, but I just walk away. In fact, I don't even walk in in the first place because I'll ask them, so what happens if people fail? How do you treat them? Because that, that's a thing, right? If you have certain cultures where failure really isn't an option, what kind, what kind of work environment is that? So yeah, I try to avoid uh, those type of cultures where I'm at. Any other questions? Cool. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, please take some time to fill out the survey. And if you are looking for people to eat with tonight, again, uh, 6.30, please sign up on the portable whiteboard so that I know you're around. I'm taking the first 18 uh, because I have a reservation already made. And after that, I, they may be able to squeeze it in, but you never know. It gets kind of tough. <laughs>